Sander, look at me. What do you see in my eyes? Death. Good evening, guys and ghouls, and welcome back to Monster Craze Memoirs, a generational podcast about B-movies. I'm your host, Ian Garcia, and joining me as always is my father, Rocco. How you doing? So this week we watched Dracula's Daughter. What did you make of the uh, the production, father? Uh, Well, compared to the other films that we just saw, I think that it's a weaker film um, in terms of like you said, it's it's functional. It's functional. It's a yeah, functional film. Yeah, it's a little film. bit mercenary, a um, little flat. It's yeah. flatter, but it, it was it, it, for people that are uh, people of my age that didn't appreciate them when they were younger. Should I think it's one that falls into that genre that should be viewed uh, in its in its context. Um, um, like it, and the some of the qualities of the film is that. Um, so, one of them being that a lot of it's carried by the by the people. It's carried yeah, it's by a very performance-driven movie. We had talked about an this atmosphere. Or, yeah. It's atmospheric. So, well, I yeah. wouldn't say that, I yeah. don't know if it's successfully no. atmospheric. No, no, it's not. It's weak. Uh, it, right. It's interesting because in a weird way, in the in the decades since it was released, like there's like you know the movie has gotten gotten a small cult following, and a lot of fans of the Universal films, uh, they tend to see this one as being superior to Dracula. But, like, I've got to say, like, I'm not even a huge fan of the original 1931 Dracula. Neither am I. But I will say it's at least atmospheric. Yes. And this one is, uh, you know, it's not for nothing. It's it's a very bare... It's not just that it's a very bare-bones production. Like, it's a movie that is clearly done in a kind of mercenary fashion. Like, the the only thing I could find out about the director, Lambert Hillier, is that he directed another of these um, cash-in universal sequels, The Invisible Ray. Uh, and he also directed the 1943 Batman serial. But otherwise, it... it, it hmm. We were talking about this earlier, where it is odd seeing... Y- you were noting that there's relatively l- little optical effects work there's yes, there's right. no real moments of no, the, there's no. no real moments of like a character's like eyes glowing white and hypnotizing people although the vampire in this does hypnotize people but there's no scenes of rubber bats flying around on wires or anything hokey like that but it, it is a you're right that I think it is a movie that's carried by the performances a lot of them I feel were pretty strong actually Yes. Uh, we've got as our stars uh, Otto Kruger playing a psychiatrist named Jeffrey Garth. He he's a, got a, uh, a a personal assistant named Janet played by Margaret Churchill. They have a very good chemistry and repertoire with one another, which really works. It's one of those classic sort of professional relationships masquerading. You know, one of those uh, um, professional relationships masking a budding romance things and then of course the uh dracula's daughter of the title countess maria zaleska uh, is played by gloria holden she does a very good performance in this movie i feel even though she did not want to be in it like apparently she was very unhappy about being given the role in particular because she had seen what had happened to um bella lugosi since starring as dracula because the story with bella lugosi is that he stars in dracula in the stage as in the stage play and then he's cast in the movie and the movie is very successful and his performance is highly praised in it but rather than signing a studio contract he decides that he wants to go independent but rather than finding that there's lots of productions willing to cast him as a leading man uh, it, it he just ends up being typecast into these B movie these B horror film roles that he's just completely underutilized in you know and so Gloria Holden was very upset about being cast in this movie because she didn't want to end up being you know getting the Lugosi treatment of being only cast as these kind of uh, dark uh, monster movie roles 
you know, this was still a time where, you know, these, you know, these movies were very much looked down upon as a form of entertainment. They were not the sort, you know, these, this is a dyed in wool B movie production, mm -hmm. you know. It's so, so good, I think. And the other thing, the other thing I would make is that the, the, that kind of romance, where did we see that before? That kind of romance where... The professional romance. Not, yeah, where he, all of a sudden he comes to realize that his, his, his assistant really does love him, although she's... But she does it more of in a joking way. But it's very right. similar to um, the movie of um, The Revenge of the Cat People, where, again... Re uh, Curse of the Cat People. Curse of the Cat yeah. People, where the... Um, or just cat people in general. No, like, Revenge you know, of the... Well, it's in it's in Cat People where uh, Alice and Oliver are like having the office relationship. She's his assistant. Uh, right. Curse of the Cat People is when they're already married. That's right. You're right. That's right. That's, that's what I meant. Curse that Cat People, I guess, is where. Anyway, we got that same kind of. Yeah, the, the, there's a, it, and it, there's it, you know there's things to like about the movie, and I think it's weird because it, I don't think it works. It doesn't really work as a horror movie because, like we said, it doesn't really have the atmosphere that is suitable to like really get you into a sort of uneasy frame of mind but the you know the... that's the other thing it didn't really engender any real fear or you know right it's just basically right that's where it fails yeah uh, but but you are right i think that like you know the chemistry between um churchill and kruger is such that it, it is surprisingly uh warm and ef and effective that you know like it t it's weird typically when you go to see one of these movies, you're prepared for the melodrama the melodramatic subplot to be the thing that you find sort of boring and uh, artificial and alienating when you're just waiting for the horror stuff to happen. With this, I felt the exact opposite. I always felt that the film was more lively when it was more about just the basic interpersonal relationships, not yes. just between, um, yes, right. not just between their relationship, but also between Kruger and, um, uh, Edward Von Sloan, who is reprising his role here as Dr. Van Helsing. The plot basically being, we, we begin where Dracula left off. Von Helsing has, uh, successfully killed Dracula. Uh, the police arrive to find, uh, uh, What's God? Red, I keep forget forgetting the uh the the zomp the serving right. guys, uh, Red, Renfield, Renfield. Yeah, the, right. the the rats guy. Yeah, they find Ren's Renfield with his neck snapped, and they find uh Dracula in his coffin with a stake through his heart, and they find Von Helsing there. And so basically, Von Hel Helsing is being detained at Scotland Yard and is being tried for murder. And so he calls in his friend Jeffrey Garth to basically act in his defense. That would have actually been pretty interesting if we actually got to see a little bit of courtroom drama of just, you know, and Von Helsing basically being humiliated, maybe drugged through the papers as like a a crazy... With the false flat is the fact that even the comic relief isn't necessary... Because there's no real tension. Yeah, there, there's a lot it's of. It's okay. Yeah, especially <laughs> yeah, especially early on, like the there's a uh, there's like a police um deputy right. or whatever you call it, right. a constable. Right. You know, you, you know he's a very superstitious guy, and you know he, you know he's got this very stereotypical like well not stereotypical I wouldn't say but like he does that sort of, uh, cliche bug eyed you know, thin-mouthed, you know, rigid sort of like, oh, I'm not going in there, you know, like right. that sort of like whole uh, bit where like he's constantly afraid of things and, you know, but, and of course his suspicions turn out to be the correct ones. And it's, it is weird. And I was thinking about this when we were watching the movie because it seems like we... There's almost this conception as, you know, as horror move as horror movies have sort of gone on and expanded as a genre, typically it isn't until like the late 80s and the early 90s that you get this sort of, you get sort of this postmodern horror movie or this idea of the self-aware horror movie where it's a horror movie where the line between horror and comedy is very much blurred because... You know, Scream be you know Wes Craven's Scream being the uh, the the number mm -hmm. one example where it's this slasher movie where the characters are constantly referring to slasher movies in universe to explain the rules of the film that the killer themselves is following along with. 
Uh, but the I think the reality is is that ever since the beginning of commercial horror, there has always been a degree of self-awareness and a degree of black humor. And I think you see that in you see that especially in um the the James Whale movies for Universal, Frankenstein, Bride of Dracula, The Invisible Man. There is a degree of sort of self awareness. Like even you know Frankenstein itself opens with these curtains opening, and out comes this sort of presenter, this very ghoulish looking guy who's like, "Oh, we must warn you that this is a very scary movie, and you better get out while you still can." You know, there's always this, right. there's always this acknowledgement that like on the part of the filmmakers in these classic days that. And we sort of rediscover it when we get into the AIP period where we even read that, you know, newspaper article where um, James H. Nicholson says explicitly that, you know, the reason kids come to see our movies is not to be scared. It's to laugh at all of the all of the ridiculous goings on is that. So I feel like there's this there's this something there's this part of horror where that's always been part of the genre, where there's always been this degree of the audience and even the filmmakers acknowledgement of the ludicrousness Mm -hmm. of just the basic premise so then you get to something like dracula's daughter and you're right it's not successfully atmospheric but there are these comedy relief moments that just completely fall flat because it's like because in you know and and they're not being really enough atmosphere right to speak of to count counterbalance it right I think the places where th- there's only two real places in the movie that I felt like there was that was hinting at a better film that could have been. The first one is when so Countess Zaleska she uh, she goes into the police station where Dracula's body is being held and she steals it away. And so she brings it into the woods where she basically gives him a Pyrrhic um, funeral where, you know, she, you know, basically a. Uh, I don't know how you would put it. She uh, she wants to. Um, she um, she commemorates his soul. You know, back right. to she his wants dark. To, really, it's an exorcism. Be thou exorcised, O Dracula, and thy body, long undead, find destruction throughout eternity in the name of thy dark, unholy master. Yeah, right. that's and the it, thing that was interesting because she even wields a crucifix in the right, scene. Right, right. She puts a crucifix onto the coffin or onto the tire. In the name of the All-Holiest, and through this cross, be the evil spirit cast out until the end of time. And and she, that's, that thought that was a pretty interesting concept, the reluctant vampire. Yeah, that was very... You see that in, in the Diary of the Vampire, right? Where Or the interview with the vampire. Interview, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I'll get these right sooner or later. You know what I'm talking about. So yeah, it Brad is. Brad Pitt character is a reluctant vampire and finally you know he tells him you know you, know, you gotta lighten up you know then the christian slater guy gets taken over so um yeah there's yeah, yeah. It, and it sets up this there's again these interesting pieces of a potential story that yes. don't really that yeah. i guess it does it does carry through with uh holden's character countess zaleska i mean more or less you're right the movie more or less becomes about a not a um, vampire who is purely villainous like Dracula, but a tragic vampire. A right. One who is a vampire. It's weird, like a vampire of circumstance. Like, right. It's like she was raised to be a vampire and she doesn't want to be a vampire. Almost like it's like... You, I, you don't really you're not really certain of like what the details of it are like you know like you like like so what happened did dracula have a vampire baby or did he transform his daughter when he uh signed his pact with really? the devil or something yeah. it's not very clear no, but it doesn't work but but it works on a dramatic level yes, because does. gloria yeah. holden do, does a good enough job of really giving you the impression that it kind of it kind of breaks through as a kind of story of like the sins of the father, like this idea of you inheriting trauma from your parents. And so she has all of this. So it becomes like, you know, we're, you know, very much um, related to cat people. It becomes a movie about uh, the supernatural horror itself being like a transmissible. Meta- yeah, yeah. Like a <clears throat> metaphor for transmissible trauma and right. psychological um, illness. 
the other part of the movie that I liked a lot, and this is cool, is the tension between um, uh, her assistant who wants to be a Janet, vampire. Yeah. Who wants to be a vampire. Wait, what? Janet? His, his assistant. Janet doesn't want to no, be no, a vampire. No, no, her assistant, uh, the, the, the Dracula's daughter's assistant. Oh, Xander. Yes, Xander yeah. Xander wants a, to be, and. Yeah, he has like a. he ha, She has a Renfield sort of servant. Who, but like not a, really. He's not a that sort he, of. Yeah, Renfield is hypnotized. Sandor, Sandor played by, isn't. played Sandor. by Irving P- Pickel, yeah, looks, is a, yeah. a sort of a sort of like sort of stock like Orientalist sort of manservant, well, like a sort of brown skinned guy, like sort of implying like the sort of long, um, you know, tendrils of history for these characters. But yeah, you're right. He has. Like he he's almost like a um. But it's a, not supernatural. He's a real evil individual that wants to attain supernatural. Well, life. he well he's bound to her, so they must like that's the thing about the vampire myth is like you're right when you. Well, I don't know how bound get... he is. He kills her at the end. So the idea is there's enough. Well, there's, he has enough independence. I think what he yeah. is, he's bought into her. Well, like maybe he, maybe he's yeah. able to kill her at the end because she breaks the bargain, because he because he mentions that. Uh, you know, because basically she ends up becoming obsessed with Dr. Garth because he's a psychiatrist and she comes to believe that he can potentially cure her of her bloodthirst so that she can, like, li- lead... You know, she kind of has this delusion that she can lead a normal life. Right, right. That now that her father is dead, that she doesn't have to be bound by the past anymore. And so she kind of becomes obsessed with Dr. Garth and kind of wants to make him her paramour and xander brings up the idea that he was promised that for his service that he would be made into a vampire right and so basically so he's almost like a eunuch figure he's kind of like this this uh this castrated male who exists totally to serve to serve this diabolical woman but you're right there is this well, tension here's the, is that you raise a very good point and that's what we'll get back to this when you talk about the whole idea of, uh, which I disagree with. Well, the, the sexual I subtext dis- of it, I yeah. dis- disagree with you 100% on that, but uh, we'll talk about that as we debate it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he, his main intention is to become supernatural, and sex is not anything about it. You're like, I wouldn't say he's so much of a eunuch. He has no care about that. He wants to be, he wants to have life ever after. Here you talk about an evil individual that's bought in. He's not a Renfield servant... Renfield yeah, he's not crazy. like he's not insane like no, Renfield. He's just and, evil. And what's interesting is that there's a sort of tension between them because the power relationship with them is so weird because on the one hand she he is her servant, but she kind of is so prepossessed to this idea of eventually exactly. liberating herself from the the grasp of her father's curse and he's the one who's constantly telling Reminding her, her you, you, can, like there's right? no there's no escape and that's you're bound she's forever she's playing the piano right yeah she's there's this great to say, no, like that was I'm another free now and he says no you're not you're gonna you know and then she finds she's playing the music because she interprets it as like this is this thing i remember from you know from hundreds of years ago the world of light the world life, right. but she mentions that it's specifically the world of twilight of that that state between night and day, mm-hmm. the state between her innocence and then when she fell from grace. But he has a completely different interpretation of the music. Is that like, no, this is this is not a, you know, this that the music is not innocent, the music is melancholy. Yeah, but the, the music, mu- music changes. If you yeah. notice, he's playing something that reminds her of her pre-vampirism state and then it transforms into... Yeah. The inevitability that she as can't. he's reminding her, right? So it's almost it, yeah, and it's weird. It's almost like he has like a control over her yes. in a weird way that yes. he that he's weaving a spell right. that is prepossessing her to doing to remaining in this state of um, darkness and this state of fatalism and this state of um, vampirism. Right. Well, she can't really escape it. Why are you afraid? I'm not. I'm not. I found release. That music doesn't speak of release. No. No. You're right. That music tells of the dark, evil things, shadowy places. Stop! 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 Right, she tries, right? So he brings a series of victims. Well, to... maybe she could if she just came to Christ. 
Like that, and that's the weird thing. Is that like it, it, that's the weird thing about like the scene where it's Dracula's funeral. It's like it's it was so odd to see these characters who are beings of the undead, who are damned souls for all eternity, but still invoking Christ because it seems like the ritual itself even seems to hold out hope that Dracula's spirit will attain some kind of salvation. That like by doing this spell that there will be some kind of mercy that is granted to him despite all of the bad things that he's done. So, it, so it's this incredibly bizarre um, kind of uh, story about these characters who, yet yeah, who are fully tragic. Like she, like it, it, and that is the disappointing thing about the movie is because eventually what ends up happening is that, you know, she's not able to break the, her nature and so she's so she's no, but like at that point it's like she stops being a tragic figure then suddenly she hatches this plot where it's like well if i can't not be a vampire then i'm going to make uh dr garth my um my paramour for all eternity and so she kidnaps and janet she has to go and, back here, and to goes go back, back to, to transylvania. transylvania that's her thought where yeah right. she goes back to transylvania and uh dr garth follows her there that's another pretty cool scene is when the everyone in transylvania is having a big old party like they're just having a festival in the streets that someone sees the light in dracula's window and they're like oh crap not this again right just like Frankenstein. We thought we finally got rid of this. the electricity, right? Through the window, right? They see it. Oh, no. Well, it's like it's the yeah. the tenants all all realized, oh, God, the landlord's back quick. Everybody hide in your house. That's a, it's kind of recurring. I like those scenes, um, those village scenes. That was one of the few, like, actually funny moments. Right. Like, it, like, it actually worked as a kind yeah. of bleakly yeah. comic. Uh, the other really atmospheric scene, I felt, is the... It's interesting because, again, this is a movie that is very much... There's a very much a dearth of actual, like, supernatural or ghoulish goings-on because there's only two vampire killings in the whole picture. One is when she she finds... A, it's after Xander and her have the sort of... Uh, their sort of Moonlight Sonata moment. Uh, and she goes out into the night and she finds like a gentleman who's just walking the streets of Soho or something. And she, you know, she hypnotizes. She has like this magic ring that she can use to hypnotize men. And so she kills that guy. But there's this other scene, the second killing, where she, where Xander picks up a, a beggar woman off the street and brings her back to her apartment under the pretense that she will model for a uh, painting she's doing or a drawing she's doing that she's an artist and like that's again there's all these little details that like you know again you could see them being the premise for a movie it's like you really wish someone like Val Luton would have been in would have been around at this time because like you you know because it is said that she is an artist like one of the people in the party where she meets meets garth's character has one of her um mm. drawings mm -hmm. so she's definitely an artist but we never like see her doing her work you know there and that sort of gets in the way of sort of, a, of attaching ourselves to her as a character but nonetheless in this scene so she brings the woman in and she and it's this very like tense and even kind of sexually charged scene because the woman, you know, she she's doing the pretense is that she's doing a study of the neck and shoulders, and of course, vampires love to bite people's necks. But it's it's this almost a sort of darkly erotic moment in the movie where you know the woman is coming out, she has to take off her blouse, so all she has underneath is the the very thin undergarments and she takes down the straps to expose her neck and her shoulder which in the 1930s is still very racy stuff it's like oh my god she's showing her shoulders i'm ready now i suppose you want these pulled down won't you yes finish your wine it'll warm you Stand by the fire for a moment. You mustn't catch cold. Well, 
Why are you looking at me that way? Won't I do? Yes, you'll do very well indeed. There's always that, but there's always that about vampires, right? That right. this sort of thinly veiled right. sort of sexual subtext sure. where Dracula is ravishing the woman That's right. and taking right. them Christopher away from Lee their does men. it before he attacks the woman, he'll kiss her and then he'll bite the neck. Yeah, there's this there's element of seduction. Kind of right. Um, I just... But this one, because it's a woman with a woman, there's almost like this more rapacious, even um, kind of vicious quality to it. And I love the way that it's done... Because it starts with, it's done all in shot reverse shot, where it begins with Holden's character, Zaleska, hypnotizing the model. Or trying to. Or trying to. She, yeah, she breaks Not successful. The, not, she's not successful in hypnotizing her. And it's great because as we're pushing in on the model's face, as she realizes that Zaleska is coming for her, the camera whip tilts up to this like horrific looking mask on the wall. And I think that was, again, that's one of the more successful atmospheric yes. moments no. because no, it gives right, you an right. impression of what right. the character is seeing that could not be represented by just looking at Gloria Holden. Like, it almost gives you an impression of, oh, do, has she, like, transformed into, like, her true self now that, you know, like, the sort of mask represents her her inner... Right, right. I think there is some charge, charge to it. I certainly is charge to it simply because... She doesn't do that to the man, right? Yeah, the, with the man, she just, she right. just like, right. she does light his cigarette. That's it. Like, right. yeah. She, I guess that's as close as you get. I guess that's as close as you get. <laughs> but yeah, with the, that one, it, and it, and that's the thing is that like, you know, I the movie itself, yeah, I don't think it's particularly good. Because all of the, all of the really good stuff sort of happens in the first half of the movie. And then by the climax... We kind of lose any sense of Zaleska, because that's the thing. What made the movie really interesting was Zaleska being this kind of tragic figure. Correct. And by the climax of the movie, we completely lose that because she just hatches this harebrained plot, and right. eventually her manservant turns against her. There's still some interesting stuff that, like, but it's all stuff that is that you're kind of extrapolating from the movie, but that it, you know, it's an hour and six minute movie, so it doesn't really. Or it's like a 76 minute movie and it doesn't really delve into anything. But like there's this there's this weird tension where it's like Janet is jealous of um, right, Gloria her, Holden's well, she character. Is, she is no different. Right, exactly. But like it's weird because it's like, you know, it's, it's this thing where it's like, you know, Gloria Holden. And that's the other thing that I don't think works is that Gloria Holden's performance never really evinces any any attraction or preoccupation with Garth. That isn't purely no, right. on the basis of right. seeing him as like kind of a savior or like a new father figure. You know, that sort of classical like, you know, psychoanalytical idea of transference where like, you know, you're the subject of the, your you know, your, psych, your psychoanalyst comes into your dreams and sort of becomes like your father figure. But yeah, like there's a lot, but it doesn't really pan out and I don't think the film is particularly good in any respect. I will say, but it does, it. so it has a cult following for two reasons. One is because people, a lot of people consider it better than the first Dracula, and I have no idea why. But the second reason that it has a cult following is that it's sort of entered into the canon of horror movies or just um, classical Hollywood films in general that are thinly veiled subtexts about queer sexuality so in this case the idea that uh countess zaleska is a thinly veiled representation of kind of a self-tortured homosexual woman when you left me last night i determined to put myself to a test as you suggested i failed it came over me again that overpowering command wordless insistent and i had to obey what was it? I, I can't tell you. It's too... too ghastly. You're a great doctor, a doctor of minds, of souls. I need you, Dr. God. I need you to save my soul. How can you expect me even to listen to you when you're concealing the truth about yourself? But I've told you all I can now. You mean you've told me all you dare? You know, where, like, and it is interesting that, like, the, the unique pairing of 
this vampire who is tortured about her own inner desires that she doesn't want to act upon, but she can't change. And this psychiatrist who comes to the conclusion that, yeah, yeah, fundamentally there's nothing that can change you and you don't want to be changed. It's this, you know, right. it's this deep-seated thing within you. It, it, you know, it's sort of, it's very evocative of a time and a place where homosexuality was still considered a mental illness and in extreme cases was often considered a personality disorder, that it was comorbid with narcissism and with psychopathy. It's very interesting. I think the art, the writers intended that. But the other thing about it is that um, vampires are, are animals. They're 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 creatures. They're not sexual. So well, they'll attack. I mean, they'll you, attack either. You say sex. that, but like we were already like you know like it, it's inextricable, isn't it? No. That like the that even the act of like biting someone on the neck is such a sensual image in order to communicate uh, violence. I mean, that's, you know? but if you want, like, if you you want to go for the jugular, you go for the jugular. But, I mean, d- but, but the, Dad, it's like, imagine, like, just think of the scene in Nosferatu where it's just this frail woman in her bed and this being, you know, this r- rat rodent-like Nosferatu, you know, just creeps into her bedroom and, you know, not, and doesn't pounce on her, but sort of gracefully falls on top of her and, you know, puts his lips to her neck. You know, like, you know, it's not something that, you know, that has ever been hidden No, no, about I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that, that it, there isn't some intent there. I'm just saying that I, I think he can't read too much into it. Maybe regardless of what the intent of the filmmaker was or the whoever wrote the script, it, it's clearly there. I'm just saying that. I'm trying to think again. I go back to interview with a vampire, where you know they he bites more men than he does women. I mean, so it 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 doesn't make it doesn't really clash, and they're not. Well, it, it, of course he does have more of a homosexual flair, well, right? <laughs> um, then 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 he does seem to have more of a homosexual flair to him. Uh, who played the uh, actual vampire? Um, Tom Cruise. Yeah. Um, so he does. He he does quite a good job at it. So yes, he does have that that dandy kind of persona. Which is very interesting. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is that, like, you know, vampires themselves are very much bound up, you know, even in their basic conception, they're bound up in in the anxieties that proliferate in Western European culture about outsiders and about the foreigner and, uh, you know, but but those those fears are always intrinsically sexual. Yeah, Dracu- I think, no, you I know. think I'm not trying to disagree with that. I just think yeah. it's a very strong film to illustrate that. I just I just think it's not. Well, yeah, dra- like, I don't, yeah, and that's the thing is that, like, but it's not, like... <sighs> I mean, look, when you look, when you look at, Bra- look at, who did Bram Stoker's Dracula? Uh, Francis the- Ford Coppola. Okay. Well, that, there it's like, just so fucking explicit. You know, it's like well, there it's not homosexual. There it's just completely. Well, it doesn't it's have to be. But what I'm saying is that it doesn't have to be homosexual. But like there right. is a, you know, like there's a sort of foundational use of the vampire in order to illustrate anxieties that, you know, because they come from such a puritanical society, they are always going to be bound up in anxieties about sex. You know, and, and um, you know, e- even the movie itself, Dracula's Daughter, you know, d- technically speaking, you know, in the opening credits, it, they say it's based on a short story by, uh, uh, yeah, like by on a story by Bram Stoker. And basically the story behind that What's is... Bram Stoker? Did he do something before Dracula? Did Bram Stoker do a short story? Well, no. The story is, is that it, Bram Stoker's original manuscript okay. for Dracula was a lot longer. And eventually, one of the uh, early episodes from the original manuscript that was cut out by the editors, he eventually um, ch- changed in minor ways and turned into its own short story that was called Dracula's Guest. That's right. That was originally published in 1914 by um, uh, Bram Stoker's widow, Florence Stoker, in a collection of short stories called Dracula's Guest and Other Stories. And so... Hmm. The story there is, you know, like there's a whole behind the scenes thing about this story. Like M- David O. Selznick at MGM ends up buying the rights to the story to basically, like, you know, basically as a hostage situation. Like, you know, like he takes, he gets the rights to the only plausible 
uh, premise that uh, Universal could have for a sequel. He basically buys the rights just to ransom some money out of Universal. Uh, but, you know, more or less there's no relationship between the, the plot of Dracula's guest and Dracula's daughter. What there is some similarity between is, you know, what seems to be a far more of an influence on Dracula's daughter is this other, less well-known vampire novel uh, by Sheridan Le Fanu called Carmilla. Now, Carmilla is a story told, again, it's much like Dracula, it's told in the form of diary entries and letters. And it's the story of a young woman who is basically in the thralls of a vampire. She's visited regularly in the night by a vampire who su not only sucks her blood, but like takes her out into the night on long dark walks and you know based in you know it has like you know long talks with her and in the and the thing is is that carmilla of the title is the mm. vampire the vampire is a woman mm. so it's this early representation of lesbianism in the form of a vampire this idea of the this this representation of homosexuality as kind of this predatory corrupting force that is you know, negatively influencing and ravishing this young woman. Hmm. And so there's parts of that that are directly influencing Dracula's daughter that doesn't become the plot of the film, but where it is contained is in how Garth then ends up interacting with the woman. Because the woman that goes to Zaleska's studio that night is not killed. She's discovered on the street, she's brought to the hospital... And she basically spends the rest of the time in, in the sort of window between life and death mm -hmm. where, you know, she's sort of still in the possession of Countess Zaleska. And the interesting thing is when Garth attempts to use his modern, you know, scientific mechanism, like he has some, I forget what the... I couldn't catch what the name of the mechanism right, he's using, a, but it's some it's sort of a strobe like, light. That, it's a sort of strobe light that, that he uses to hypnotize people. Right. But in using it in order to extract the information from her about who did who assaulted her, because that's the thing is that the police are treating it as a conventional assault. They're not treating it as supernatural. Right. But when he uses it, she dies. Right. So it's like it's this weird sort of element of like the revelation of this thing can trip again that all of these inter interesting little facets of the story that could have been expanded into something interesting but it really just are just these tendrils of of influence that don't really bear well, out into it a does though right because that's how he gets that's how he gets Garth what's the name Garth the guy who's the psychiatrist. I guess what I'm saying is that, like, you know, like, I, I'm just saying that, like, you know, that would have been a much more interesting like, movie. There are, there are like, a lot, right, there are a lot of different... The idea yeah. of, like, a, a single woman who is preyed upon by Dracula's daughter, you know, it's like you could even imagine, like, a, a later scene in which Dracula's daughter visits her in the hospital. But, of course, and this is the thing, is that, like, the... Whether or not it's very you know, overt in the film that there is a subtext of um, the fear, not just not just anxiety about sex, but specifically the fear of homosexuality and the fear of lesbianism. As, as in overt as it might be, this was absolutely something that the filmmakers were aware of and that the censors were aware of. Like, even in the original scene, you know, in as scripted, the original scene where the model comes to the studio, she was supposed to pose nude. Like, so there was supposed to be this whole other degree of vulnerability and this idea of this being explicitly a sort of thinly veiled story about a uh, homosexual desire. And of course, like, you know, part of the reason, you know, the movie was fast-tracked into production before the script was even completed. And the reason for that was partially because David O. Selznick's contract with Universal in order to get the rights to Dracula's guest and then to produce a movie, he basically gave them such a short time frame that they had to rush the film into production but the reason that they hadn't had a finished script by the time they started shooting 
was because they kept getting hung up with the production code authority because you know for, right. you know it, it, for them it was absolutely clear to them that you know besides the violent qualities of the scripts that they were being given it was very clear that there was sort of it was clear to them that the filmmakers were not just trying to create something that was terrifying, but something that was titillating, something that would would arouse. I guess I don't you know. know. The, the, I mean, he uses she uses the same technique to get the psychiatrist to go with her because she hypnotizes her his assistant, right? Of which he's very fond. I guess you start to believe he's very fond of her, and he, he agrees to he agrees that he will go with her to save the life. Of his assistant, right, right. So, whatever is in, whatever is implied, I don't know, because he obviously she chooses. Why didn't she just choose the assistant? So let's go, baby. I mean, she <laughs> she doesn't, right? So the idea is that well, they couldn't show that. I know. It's like they the point because that would have been too explicit. I know, but that just, just I mean, I'm, I understand what they're saying, and I believe that's true. I believe that stuff is written in there for that particular purpose, but I wouldn't say that's a real strong. Um, I don't know, case for it. But I do, I do agree that, that there is some elements of that in it. I guess it's really only more interesting because, you know, I... I, I guess the background... We were going to record... Yeah, we were going to record this last night, but I decided that I wanted to re-watch this documentary called The Celluloid Closet. And the reason I wanted to re-watch that is because it's a documentary about representations of homosexuality and queer gender identity in cinema from about from its inception to uh, the time in which the documentary was made and it is interesting because they do use that clip from Dracula's daughter in the studio as a sort of as a representation of this is very much an arc you know like homosexuality was usually just used as a joke in movies before the production code authority really went into the to effect but you know it was it was rare to see it represented but when it was represented it it was as a joke but there was also like this very like i remember seeing a, there was another clip in the movie where you see a movie from the night the early 30s that shows a representation of a gay bar you know like it was very much this thing that was you know, merely the fact that they were making fun of homosexuality showed that there was a, enough of a mainstream popular consciousness of there being this kind of subculture of homosexuals living in modern day America that they could put that in a movie and that audiences would be, that it would be accessible to audiences. Right. What happens right. is sort of the Hayes Code comes in completely forbids any depiction not just of sex outside of the context of marriage but specifically homosexuality which is just deemed sexual perversion it's basically deemed the same as miscegenation or or necrophilia or any anything else and so what happens is that there comes this transition where home in the 30s and 40s homosexuality is only represented symbolically or it non-explicitly in movies, but suddenly, far from being just the subject of humor, suddenly you get these archetypes of the predatory homosexual. You get these archetypes of the... In this case in particular, basically what Dracula's daughter is depicting is this archetype of the self-tortured tragic lesbian this character whose very desire is something that they're constantly fighting within themselves and but like is is this is portrayed as this thing which is related to some predatory instinct like mm. almost like this idea that because she has desires for women she's effectively a man so like if she's if she has male sexuality, then that means that any her desire for a woman is inherently rapacious in a way that she's inherently forcing herself on someone like, you know, there's no element of like seduction. It's not like in Dracula, you know, this pre code movie. It's not like in Dracula where there is this element of seduction. There is this element of. You could imagine a woman falling for Bella Lugosi. Like, he's a very handsome man with a very mysterious accent. With Dracula's daughter, on the other hand, it's pure terror. This image of this, and again, like, again, this almost, like, frigid 
costuming that um, Gl Gloria Holden's character has, all in black and very confined inside of herself. She, you know, it's like so. It's this very so. It's part of this emergent archetype that you see last you know, well into the 70s of, like, homosexuality always being portrayed as something that's nefarious mm -hmm. or duplicitous or not to be trusted. And, of course, setting up this sort of narrative art, this narrative template where, you know, in the third reel, the evil homosexual has to die. I think I agree with you that, like, it's not really the best example that you could show somebody. I think a much better ex Like, I think the irony is that there's two much better examples. One better example I would sh say is Rebecca. I think that was released in 1944. There's a... Not stated, but there is a, um... Tragic, predatory lesbian character in that movie that I think is a much better representation of that trope. But we've even seen our own example of a movie that I think does that a lot better. We saw Cat People. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that was, you know, and Cat People is a movie that does it without having there to be this sort of pseudo titillating scene right. with one woman and another. But we were talking about that, weren't right. we? That right. like there's almost like, you know, conventionally it's interpreted as a story of like, oh, this is about how feminine sexuality, if it's not guarded carefully enough, it will explode and it will devour men. As opposed to the idea that, no, she's just repulsed by men. She she doesn't she, she doesn't fit into these right. sort of right, sexual right, right, conventions. Right, right. Yes, yes. I agree. That's right. That's right. In that movie particularly. Right. And obviously it's also a much better movie. Yes, it is. Like, and I would have to recommend that. I, you know, I think Dracula's Daughter is all right, but like, I don't, I don't really understand the, uh, the cult following for it. Here's your vampire, Sir Basil. The arrow. A wooden shaft through her heart. Just as I drove the stake through his. The woman is beautiful. She was beautiful when she died. A hundred years ago. would you say was the first moment not the first moment that's a little too specific but like what where when about in general do you think you you sort of became conscious of the idea that there were people in society who were attracted to people of the same sex when yeah like probably what, grammar school grammar school so what when about was that that would have been like you mean like middle school mm-hmm so like how like no yeah you know there are a couple of people that were um and they were they were horribly bullied so um oh you mean like in the school well yeah so did you know that they were or was it more of no, a thing they, that they, they were kind of effeminate yeah or? but the idea is it came out later that they were so okay um you know it's you, i'm trying to think of any other uh instances but you know when you're younger you don't you're not part of that you're, you're in a protective bubble so you really don't you really don't get the chance. You're not like adults. Adults have a pretty well wide range of what's going on. They understand things. They just reject them. But when you're younger, you don't see that. You don't yeah. see that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think it's very like I think I can remember when I was a kid. Like I think it is the thing where it's like I think you're right. It was the same with me where it's like it wasn't until like middle school that I really sort of right. intuited that there were people in the world who did were not attracted to people of the opposite sex but when you're young especially when you're a young man you learn very early on about how to police your behavior in order to not appear feminine and part of it is just being not part of it is just sexism part of it is just not wanting to be perceived as girly to be perceived as a real man but like as i grew older I sort of started to realize how much of that is also bound up in the idea of not, you know, sort of a prosaic understanding that 
you have to be a certain way in terms of your expression of your gender and in terms of an expression of your sexuality mm -hmm. in order right. to in order to be respected right you know it's like it, and i don't think it no it, i mean like i there are a lot of things i missed obviously i saw the other movies too and there, all the younger all those um things you see when you're older and what you glean through it, if you do an analysis of it, those things are fly over most people's heads. They just yeah. go to the movies and watch them. So this is only when you go into in-depth like that. So well, I'm sort of trying to move a little bit beyond the movies to try to... I mean, like, so, like, you sort of came into an understanding that those people existed around middle school. When did you... When do you think you came around to a sort of a sort of coherent understanding in your mind that they were because i feel like there's two stages one is the stage where you realize that homosexuals exist and the other stage is where you realize that they are victimized in certain ways that are oppressive and that are wrong like what like do you like when do when about do you think like you sort of develop, or did was it sort of unconscious for you? Did you ever like really care about that sort of? No, stuff? you just you know you didn't see it, right? Yeah. So it's underground, right? So you don't really see anything. Even in college, you didn't. I didn't see. I don't remember any circumstance in college where it came out or where it was seen. Uh, I, I'm certainly was there. Um, it was the 70s, uh, so you know, 1969 to 1973. So. Um, and then all of a sudden, you go to grad school, and there you're at parties, and people are inviting in gay people all the time. So then all of a sudden, it's like what happened between... I think it's just the way the culture you're in. I think that it depends on the circumstance. Yeah. What I didn't see on one campus, you go to Rutgers, and then all of a sudden, it was perfectly acceptable. Everything's just... Mm. You know, here they are. Here's Jack and Joe, and, you know, they, they're homosexuals, and they're here at the party, and they, we had a lot of different... People that would come into the that is that's interesting. kind of very interesting. It's yeah, that's what I mean. It's well, because it's it's interesting because it's like you know, there's for you it's interesting because it's almost like you sort of you're sort of you had a kind of insulated consciousness as a kid. You were a very sort of myopically like at least the impression I get is that you were very forwardly focused as a kid. You kind of concentrated on what was in front of you. Well, you, you know, know what? We were, I think it, it's a matter of density, isn't it? So when yeah. you look at where we lived here, this is all farm. Yeah. So your chance of seeing someone like that is kind of low. But then when you get into a broader, well, now we're more dense, and you get into a broader situation like a college campus, now even at Ryder, Ryder's not a big campus. It's 8,000 students. It's maybe even harder to hide things when they're... 4,000 yeah. commuters, 4,000 that lived on campus. I'm sure there were clubs... Because it was because after it was in the seventies when they when did the DSM nineteen seventy four I believe was when they officially took um, homosexuality off yeah, of their off list. Yeah, the, it was of, off the thing. So and then um, uh, they removed it from their list of mental illnesses. It, yeah, it was right. no longer and no. that's and that in that in itself is just mind boggling to think just like the the extent to which that sort of prejudice was just married to american culture and not just to american culture but to american sciences just to the the science of the mind for so long just presupposing that you know there was something inherently i think it was earlier than that but it wasn't taken off the books until later Well, people were challenging it because certainly. right yeah because by that point people just said this is stupid because then they found there's a whole range yeah. All of a sudden, it wasn't just this and this. It's well, of course, in the 1940s, a little later than Dracula, you get the Kinsey it... report, and Kinsey is like, yeah, it turns out that most people in their life experience some form. No, of... yeah, so Kinsey's report came out that was in the 40s, like you said. We all we all had it. It just did, I don't know why it took so long to get into the fabric of the... Uh... Anyway, so, yeah, it just... It just was, I think you have to, it's it, it's a density, it's a density issue. The more people you have in the closed quarters, like a city, you're mm. going to see more of it. Yeah. Now, so as a graduate student, I went to, went to Florida, and we went, we went to gay bars. 
Who no. cares? Yeah, I'm there to get let's drunk. Get, let's get a drink. Did anyone said, make a pass at you? No. You look around. I said, wait. The Gordon, people scanned. We're looking at one another. Gordon, what kind of bar is this? It was like no <laughs> Hemingways or what are off Hemingway? Hemingways. <laughs> it was somewhere in. in it was entirely uh, all men there. And I said, well, that's kind of bizarre. Why are they? <laughs> you walked into a fucking... Gordon looks you like, were in a Bill Murray We didn't care. We didn't care. We just drank. You talk to people. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not... <laughs> this is like a sitcom. Yeah. It's just like you, you're... Ugh. Yeah. So I depends. knew I shouldn't have asked you this question because it's like you, ha you have such an enchanted life. Yeah, it's like you, Like you have such a unique mind, like the way you like... in interpret and react to things it's just like the like just even and even you kind of had like a blessed trajectory too because you just kind of went into you just kind of were forward thinking your whole life and then completely unperceptibly to you not only were all of the homosexuals starting to come out of the closet in the 70s and 80s it was becoming but it was it was becoming more accepted so like it's almost like you know, like you were just in the social circles. Well, I don't that... think it was necessarily accepted. I well, just think that. Well, becoming the, the, the there. people that we were with, it was acceptable. Right. So, there are bisexuals. You have women that were bisexual. I know for a fact two or three are bi, and they got married, had kids. There's a whole gamut of people that I that we've experienced. Helen knows them too. So she, I mean, she we because we, we went in the same circles. So wait a minute. How can he be married? Weren't, wasn't she a lesbian? Just a, we, there were lesbians on Rutgers campus. There were faculty there. There obviously you have the whole gamut. It's but a spectrum. It's, it's a spectrum. Yeah. So it, it it's not it's not the it just didn't affect me like that. Like other people, some people are really really uh, repulsed by it, and almost to a point of um mm. of just a hostility to it. I mean, I don't understand that. I guess I never I, did understand. I so. think uh, in the celluloid closet, I forget who mentions it, uh, but one of the screenwriters in the movie she mentions how, and I guess we can relate it to depictions of homosexuality in film. Uh, she says that. Uh, Americans find it impossible to watch something and focus on the person rather than on the act. So when mm -hmm. Americans see two men kissing, mm -hmm. they find it impossible to not imagine themselves kissing and uh, kissing a man. Right. And so immediately that sends off a repulsive you know, it sends a repulsion into them because it, because they, this is something that they've been sort of subtly taught all their lives that they are not and that that's weird and that's atypical. Like, do you think there's some truth to the idea that like a lot of homosexual, a lot of homophobia is more or less rooted in just repressed queer desire, th that a lot of it is just a sort of visceral reaction to your own desires being brought up inside of you and you kind of having a violent rejection of it just because of your own uh the the bigotries that you've been taught no no mm -mm. i think that there are i mean men like to watch lesbian flicks but they don't like watching homosexual like men men homosexuals well that's a bit different isn't it no the idea is exactly what you said. So the the the, the it, it because whatever your uh, predilections are, you're going to have an evolution to it anyway. It's not cultural. Yeah, well, maybe it is because in Roman times, right? It was that very common, right, to have homosexual and heterosexual relationships. Well, the, and it, this is the thing: is that like in the different countries, and this lesbos, is the thing: is that right, like the island where this you know Lesbos, where Sappho. And this is the thing: the is writer. that like you know, like I think it, you know, it's like a huge. I think a huge part of queer sexuality, and this is something that I only really, you know, it was something I only really discovered when I went to college, and it, it's only things that I discovered about myself is that like. The extent to which that I was never in denial about aspects of my own orientation that were queer. And so I never really came out about them. Right. But like I was never really in denial about them, but right. I sort of had this these sort of steady realizations that like, oh, I've never I've just never done these things before because I've never been in a context where they would have been accepted. 
Like, you know, it's like, so I wonder if, like, you know, like, how many people are living in America who just... A lot. They have these feelings within them, but like they, they're just they've never they yeah. they lot. the context in which they're a raised lot. in. Yeah. Fifteen percent. Yeah. At least. <laughs> At least. So but, you know, it's it's the spectrum, Kinsey right? report. He would so, say that most people fall in the middle somewhere. Right? They fall in the middle. It's like this. The curve is this way. It's a bell so, curve. Right. So I mean, so it, there's a whole great grad, gradation of different. No, I agree. I agree 100 percent with that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting topic, but. And I think that's what some of these writers, you know, when they write stuff in, I think there is some kind of aspect to it that they're trying to get at. Yeah. It's hard to tell, though. I mean... Yeah, that's the thing. I should have looked up if the screenwriter, if any of the screenwriters for um, Dracula's Daughter were homosexual themselves. Right. I should have done that because I, I get the feeling with the movie that it is kind of written by people who have a very kind of... Uh, a very kind of heteronormative view of what lesbianism is as opposed to like i never really got the feeling that the movie is like leg authentically uh sympathetic to zaleska as a character i never really got the feeling that they were authentically concerned with depicting her as a person and not merely as a kind of a vehicle for just you know just sort of a stereotypical or, you know, just typical horror movie shenanigans that right. in this case they found out a way that they could maybe make it titillating. Well, I think you're right. I think a lot of people, when you can't, you know, it's one way of getting their message out, right? Right. Um, and maybe that's where it worked. And it, and if, you're, if you saw some of the clips of that movie where Burl Ives confronts um, his son, uh, um Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Yeah. Is, plays B Bick, I think. I forget name? what the name. Uh, yeah. Tea and Sympathy, isn't it? No, no that's it. No. Cat, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. And, yeah. And Girl Ives. And they is, can't mention it. It's in the stage right. play, but they can't mention well, it maybe in the you're movie. Morton friend. What are you talking about? All he was was a good friend, and maybe. <laughs> but he. So there are kind of interesting. There are. This is of, my roommate. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> we do anything for my roommate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I mean, you see it. I mean, it's not like it's not. It's not. And I like they. they and it's they, like an open secret almost. Right. But some are more overt. For example, advice and consent. It's yeah. A very, very, very. I, yeah, that mo that movie grossed me out. That was a good movie. It they, was a good movie, yeah. but that scene, like it, mm -hmm. finally seeing that, it's you know, like and, and I. That's think, more overt. Yeah, more that was the first, and that's the th yes. sort of that's the sort of weird thing, is that a lot of these old. It's weird because you know in the celluloid closet. The ending of the celluloid closet is sort of this, is sort of like this sort of triumphant moment because it shows you all of these clips from like movies by queer filmmakers during the 90s that are portraying like, you know, authentic gay relationships, gay characters who are not either, you know, psychopaths and killers, but who are also not just these maudlin, self-torturing, tragic figures, you know. It portrays it as being like, you know, you know, the 90s independent movie scene. This is where, like, you know, the, the gay cinema is finally coming into its own. And the thing that I realized while I was watching the movie is that, like, the, the, none of these movies have survived in the cultural lexicon. They came out in the 90s and then they were instantly, you know, they were never canonized. They were never... You know, I never see them being shown on Turner Classic movies. And then it's like, and I think about, like, the movies that have the most staying power with regards to representation of homosexuality are still the ones that have the most sort of retrograde attitudes about them. And Advise and Consent is an example of that. Like, you know, like, I think Advise and Consent was the first movie I ever saw that depicted a gay bar in it. And of course, it's like this nightmarish, you know, it's this nightmarish netherworld. It's like this hell to well, which... It's meant to be... Uh, yeah, you're right. It's just... Right, exactly. In Vise and Consent, it's like that, right? It's almost like it's a... They went... Uh, it's, like, it's like hell. It's like this right. sort of like, right. you know, it's the personal hell of right. this politician. And, and, and Satan said, come on in. Exactly, yes. It's like, yeah, the bartender is like literally Satan. Hey, just don't, that. don't just stand there. You know, it, and I just, it is kind of just sad, isn't it? Because it's like, you know, it's like, I feel like 
every time there's sort of a there's sort of a moment where there's there's kind of like a flagship moment every couple of years where you know in in 2006 it was broke back mountain where it's like can you believe this finally like you know a a, a big you know a significant american prestigious award winning film depicting a Mm -hmm. uh, intimate relationship between two men and then and then you know very recently in 2018 we had love simon which is you know one of the one of the f a mainstream high school drama about a gay a, a gay student who's in the closet and who begins a relationship with someone who he meets in the chat room and his sort of investigation to try to find out who the other student is who's in the closet. What uh, about the one that we just, Timothy Chalamet and, and uh, you know what I'm talking Call about. Call Me By Your Name? Is that it? Call Me By Your I Name? I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, yes, Call Me By Your Name. That's what it was. That was a pretty good movie. That was a good movie, yeah. but it's like... My I thought that, yeah, I thought that was a pretty good movie. My concern is, is that, like, there... I don't know. It's like, it, it's so... Like, I, I hope that... This is sort of the, the, that the, you know, the wave is finally, you know, I, like, I hope that, like, this is sort of the moment where, you know, queer cinema or films about, you know, openly gay characters, I hope that these, that this is sort of the moment in history where mm -hmm. it finally sticks. Like, the movies actually start being remembered because it seems so, it, it, just even watching, again, just watching The Celluloid Closet, it was sort of like a tragic feeling for me. It's that, like, this is just this 1995 documentary with this triumphant ending about, you know, this surge in queer cinema. And, that, and now I'm watching it in 2018, and I'm just like, oh, none of it stuck. It was just a wave that crashed... And then Hollywood went right back to this don't ask, don't tell policy or of just using homosexuality as a joke, using, mm -hmm. you know, queer insults as a as pejorative. It, it, it really is kind of like a it, I don't know. It just says something about like how how deeply rooted our basic fear of. Well, I don't think it's that. Isn't it just commercialism? How many do you want? How many how many queer films do you want to have? I mean, I it's not that I I well, well I I've been it's not to, that you I, have it, some it's, decent ones. That we have sure, them, right? but like the but I'm talking about but I'm talking about their saliency. I'm talking about like their ability to be like brought up again and again, so that I'm it's not in 2020 and I'm watching a documentary from 1995 and this is oh. the first fucking time I'm hearing about like these dozens well, of gay films maybe, made in night maybe that needs to be updated. I mean, yeah, but it's just like maybe you need to go back and then redo the whole thing and bring it to modern day. The, the people, half the people that were on there is interviewing are dead. <laughs> Tony Curse is dead. These people are dead. They're not alive anymore. The guy, uh, what was the the writer? Uh, he's dead. The the famous uh, author. Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal. But not the ones in the nineties. They're not dead. They just got ignored. It's just like it, ah, like yeah. I, and yeah, I understand that it's a function of capital, and I guess maybe that's the lesson: is that like we, it's impossible for. It, that basically capitalism just eclipses any sense of hope. That once they've. Once they've exhausted well, the ability. That's not true. What about the ones that are on? Uh, they're on cable. There's a whole queer, uh, the, the L word, right? There's a queer and something. There, there, there are a number of ones that are out there that have a whole. I don't necessarily think that. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, yeah, they they have their blockbuster own blockbuster films. Well, yeah, they have their own separate but equal channels. But the, but those. I'm talking but about. They have their series, and everybody looks at them. It isn't just. You know, does everybody look at them? Well, I don't look at them because I don't have the time to look at. Them. I mean, I'm saying gotta, even people who have, you, yeah, even people who have plenty of time, I, I guarantee you that they're not watching. No, we do. Like these, yeah. Well, you're not going. They're not going to watch them because you know they're there. There's more stuff to say, right? They're not going to watch them because the it, the culture isn't there. No. Like I feel like it's this thing where it's like it's not just a bigotry against queer people in general. It's like this deep seated fear of anything permeating and like this overarching heterosexual norm. Well, that's why I, I agree a hundred percent. 
that agree. That and that's exactly what I mean. That's exactly the point. But you know, that, and that, so you're trying to say that you know, I mean, why aren't there? How many good films are on drug addiction? I mean, let's face right. it. Uh, Requiem for a Dream. Um, they go down the list. There aren't that many. Train spotting. There aren't that many. The though. man with the golden arm. But there aren't that many. Right. What are you yeah. talking about? It's a James Bond movie, Man with Golden Arm? I don't know what it was in terms of drug. No, I mean, you're thinking of gold. You're either thinking of Golden Eye or Goldfinger. The Man with the Golden Arm oh, is the one where Frank gun. Sinatra has a heroin addiction. Oh, okay. All right. All right. But, but yeah, like, I guess maybe the problem is my fault that I've been lazy, that I haven't, you know, that I had, you know, it's like it takes a documentary from 1995 to make me aware of these things. But, yeah, like, I guess it was only watching Dracula's Daughter again. Because that was the thing. I found out about Dracula's Daughter when I saw the, um, the celluloid closet in college. That was the first time I found out about it. And so now I'm coming back to Dracula's Daughter years later. And through that, I'm watching the celluloid closet again. And I'm just saying to myself, God damn, like, it it really is just the same fucking shit show. It yeah, really everybody is the watches same, Ben-Hur. I it think really it, is the same ghettoization yeah. of queer culture. So that it's, again, it, like it, it's like it, it is don't ask, don't tell. It is yeah. still the same treated as an open secret, where it's superficially we embrace these things. But, like, I don't... I think I think it's still like Dracula's daughter or like you know uh, Arena and the Cat People. I still think it's like a kind of maudlin, you know, story of like loneliness and in the margins. And it's not, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a depressing conclusion to the episode. Do you have a funny story? Anything it's not funny. It's you want uplifting, to but it's not funny. But it's uplifting. Yes, I, 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 since you're on the subject about this. Um, Years ago, when I was attending a meeting, I believe it was somewhere in um, in um, Oregon. But anyway, we took this long trip. My my student and I took this long trip around, and we landed in in uh, Monterey, and we went. We found a place in Monterey to stay, and then we drove to Carmel uh, for breakfast, or w- went there to I guess get coffee. We stopped in the shop to get coffee, and some people came in, and then regular, it's a regular kind of where you go to the stand and you sit right. That's well, you know, a diner. It's, it's like a diner it's... type, exactly, but it's much, it was pretty. It was a nice place. It was beautiful. Carmel's beautiful. Um, and um, I was sitting there, and you know, it was warm out, you know, so we were dressed, right? We are dressed. We have, we have our shirts and our shorts and things like that. And we're sitting there, and my friend and I were talking, and this guy comes in he's ordering a cup of coffee and i start oh how you doing they said we start chit-chatting just talking i said oh yeah i have a business i have to drive up into somewhere up to santa cruz for business and then i come back here i actually live down farther down into um you were living in um california at the time? no 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 this was just a trip okay but you were science staying science brought us to do Meetings. Remember when we went right. to San, we went to Corrado that time, yeah. San Diego. Yeah, it's like that. Well, your creature was sick, so, <laughs> but, yeah. but it was like that. So every time, so and so this guy, we're talking, and he sits down. We have a cup of coffee, and I'm carrying on this conversation, and John's having a conversation with the guy about you know how the area and stuff like that, and he's talking to me and stuff like that, and then he puts his hand on my leg, <laughs> like this, and he starts rubbing it. <laughs> Uh, right, uh, I'm, I'm still having a conversation. <laughs> I'm having a co- co- you shouldn't have worn those shorts. You were asking for it. <laughs> and we had this conversation, and you know, and and John was just, he's like, his eyes went like he was having a gay panic moment. He had a gay panic, and and he was pissed. He had a gay. Panic. Oh no! How how are you feeling though? Like, were you no problem? <laughs> this is the thing your blessed brain just like no uh, i said like literally just like there's a there's a, I, there's a synapsis that no, fires in your brain say that what says happened. hey like there's it's like your brain is like two brains talking to each other one brain hemisphere is saying hey rocco he's he's got his hand on your left leg the other hemisphere is saying oh i don't care <laughs> no i don't and the idea is that in fact i had a con- let the you were it thinking, was, was oh, a, I let him on a bit, poor guy. It's a post conversation. <laughs> I just, I said, and, he, and I just look. I said, I know, I know. 
I said, I hate to tell you. I know you, how this looks. I but, kind I said, of just... But I'm telling you, I'm straight. I'm sorry. And he says, oh, that's okay. I just didn't know. And, then, <laughs> and we still had a conversation. I can't remember, I can't remember the details. You of let him of, down easy. No. <laughs> yeah. I didn't let him down at all. The point is, it's ridiculous. I wasn't repulsed by it, nor was I um, elated by it. You weren't it's, flattered? Not well, a little bit of you might have no, been flattered. Though. The oh. point is that you don't, that, that's the way people are. So when I say you have a curve, that doesn't, bo- doesn't bother me. Right. So he got up and we said goodbye. I shook hands. We left. But when I, it was the post conversation that was worse. We got out and got into and the car. Who's this friend you're with again? It's, Sorry, it's like... one of the guys that I, was one of my oh, students. Oh, student, yeah. But he was a graduate. But he student. was repulsed. He was just like shaking the rock. I don't understand. What the hell are you doing? I said. Well, I <laughs> then he said, "What?" Well, I said, "John, we well, just relax, will you? What is your problem? He didn't. He, there is no. What offense was created? Right. You put a hand on someone's shoulder. You put. I mean." What, what, what offense was created by him? To, I was trying to explain to him. I'm, no, I don't. He wasn't a, wasn't offensive, nor was he being aggressive. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman. <laughs> yeah. very, he very, treated me very, very well. British you right. can learn some things from him. <laughs> anyway, that's my uplifting moment. That Just like you have the people that are, like my other friend that I had was absolutely a, a homophobe to the point of almost hysterics. So you get the people that are act. There's actually deep seated hatred, and then you, there are other people. Like I said, there are friends of ours or acquaintances that I lived with that invited gay, lesbian, didn't matter. They came in, they had partied along with us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's the way it is. It's a life. It's not a lifestyle. It's a. It's a. You know. It's a. a um, it's your. Your. It's a kind of it's a fact of your being. Right, it's a fact of your being, right? It's your it's your predilection. It's just the way it is. And um I was always born with that. You think you just kind of always had a never bothered me.